Welcome into the Big Ten Huddle. I am your host, JR, and we are here to talk about all the things that happen in week three of the Big Ten. I'm joined today by two awesome guests. I have Mark Rogers of The Voice of College Football, and I have Sonny from the Illini cast here at Big Banter Sports. We're going to let these guys introduce themselves and tell you where to find them. Mark, where, you, where can we find you? Yeah, you can find us right uh, here on YouTube. Just search uh, The Voice of College Football. We've got 15 team channels, and we've got a main national channel as well. We do a Big Ten show every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern time as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'll be sure to link Mark's channel there in the description. You can find that there. Sonny, tell us where people can find you. Sure. Uh, I'm at Illini Cast, both on YouTube and also on Twitter and basically all the social medias. At Illini Cast is based mainly on Illinois football and Illinois basketball and Illinois athletics in general. You can also find me at the Sunny V, where I kind of talk about sports on a more general level. Awesome. Thanks, Sonny. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and you can find Sonny at Big Banter Sports, we are brought to you by Big Banter Sports, BigBanterSports.com. You can go there for all of your Big Ten media needs. You can find this podcast. You can find podcasts about every Big Ten team. You can find everything you need to find about Big Ten there as well. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you're listening on podcasts, please rate us. We put out an episode every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We recap the week. We talk about what is going on the next week. We preview things. And we also talk about news and notes. So be sure to do that. We'd love to have you there. Our first game that we're going to be talking about is Penn State versus Illinois. Penn State beat Illinois 30-13. to 13. Uh, The offense for Penn State wasn't as good as maybe some might think considering how many turnovers the defense got. But the defense was spectacular. They really took advantage of the young signal caller and Luke Altmeyer, who really had a hard time. Mark, what were some of your thoughts on this game? Yeah, this was the game I wanted to see and was really focused on at uh, noon Eastern. And Illinois obviously was coming off a situation in which they got ambushed in Kansas. And that had to be kind of tough to take for a pretty proud defense. I know they lost uh, three players in the first three rounds of the NFL draft, plus their D coordinator, Ryan Walters, to Purdue. But still a ton of talent left, especially in the front seven on this defense. And the most impressive player... Despite the final score, the most impressive player in this game was Jerzon Johnny Newton. That guy is phenomenal. Uh, he reminds me of different type player, but in terms of making an impact on a game, he reminds me of, at some point last season, it uh, dawned on me that Harold Perkins of LSU was just changing games. He was, you know, it's difficult for a defensive player to have that kind of an impact where he's the most impactful player on the field. and. Johnny Newton is just, he's hes crazy good. He's exceptional. The Illinois defense being put in a bad position over and over and over and over. Three consecutive turnovers in the first half continue to hold the rush defense, considering that they were facing the team that might have been running the football better than anybody in the Big Ten with those two studs coming back for their sophomore years, Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. I was impressed with the Illinois defense. But as you mentioned, you can't get away with a zero to five turnover margin if you're the underdog by two touchdowns facing one of the most talented teams in the country. So Luke Altmeyer did some good things, did a lot of bad things. And, you know, it was a combination of Penn State being just extremely well-schooled and athletic on defense. You know, some of the interceptions they had were really tremendous plays, not just thrown in their laps, but Luke Altmeyer still made some bad reads, some bad throws, and that was their undoing. Uh, think that maybe they should have uh, stuck to the ground game and firing straight ahead at Penn State, but not a great showing by Illinois when all is said and done. However, considering the opponent and the uh, five turnover margin, they hung in there pretty well. Well, I'm kind of a lone voice when it comes to the positivity for Illinois football <laughs> uh, yesterday. I this is going to sound weird, but we lost thirty to thirteen. But I feel better as an Illinois fan than I think a Penn State fan should feel about Penn State. Our first two games, our defense was awful. Uh, the new defensive coordinator, Aaron Henry, he played for Brett Bielema. He was the guy. He was our uh, secondary coach last year, and Brett picked him over the guy who was supposed to be the defensive coordinator, Kevin Kane, who ended up following Ryan Walters to uh, Purdue. Our defense was awful the first two weeks and Aaron Henry was basically all the fans were kind of going after him like hey adjustments need to be made what are we going to do about it 
Luke Altmaier for the first two weeks was arguably the best quarterback in the Big Ten West. Um, he was a bright spot with his legs, keeping us in games and making throws that no Illinois quarterback has been making in the last 10, 15 years. Now, yesterday, our defense completely showed up against Penn State uh, over and over again, uh, as Mark was alluding to. Their two running backs, I thought, could combine for 200 yards yesterday if they wanted to, except once the kickoff happened, they couldn't. Um, our defense showed up over and over again. It was Luke Altmaier who, unfortunately, just had an awful game. Uh, people kind of forget that Luke Altmaier has less game experience than Drew Aller does. You know, this was just his third start, and this is his first real, you know, tough game against a Big Ten uh, team. So he also needs to kind of go through his growing pains. I think in the first half, you know, uh, having three turnovers and only being down 16-7 to what I think is a top five team was, you know, an impressive showing. Moving forward, as long as Luke Altmaier's performance the first two weeks and the defense from yesterday kind of meet in the middle somewhere, no one in the Big Ten West is really jumping ahead. You know, Iowa's probably the best-looking team so far, but they're just playing Iowa ball. Wisconsin, I thought they were overhyped uh, in the offseason, and I think they're kind of proving my point right now. Minnesota, we'll talk about later, has to find an offense. I think that it doesn't look good for Illinois, but I'm not as you know depressed as some of the other fans. Penn State has some issues, though. Uh, Penn State, uh, you know, Johnny Newton, I'm Johnny Newton's biggest fan in the world. Uh, all offseason, I was saying he was the best defensive tackle in the Big Ten, and now the nation kind of saw it uh, for themselves yesterday. He had his way against NFL caliber uh, offensive line. The Penn State offense, you know, yeah, they looked great against the non-Power 5 teams, but when they went up against Illinois, an Illinois team that could not stop Kansas, could not stop Toledo, they went toe-to-toe with them for our, an entire first half. Eventually, again, Altmaier, I think his confidence got shot. He just kept trying to force throws in the second half. Our game plan was thrown out the window. We could not run the ball anymore. Brett's, Brett Ball basically you know, was done. Um, Penn State, I think, they had kind of a eye-opener in the sense where this may have been the slap that they needed in the face because next week they got Iowa, and Iowa's not going to make the same mistakes that Illinois made. Right, yeah, I think the Illinois fans have some things to be positive about here. Obviously, it's never good to lose by, you know, 17 at home, but I do think there are bright spots here, and I do think you're right. I think there's some st- things for Penn State that they need to make sure they address as well, just like any team. It's week three, you know, nobody's going to be perfect right now, uh, but but you're exactly right. Moving into Ohio State versus Western Kentucky, Ohio State is looking like the Ohio State offense of last year, again, 63-10. to 10. Now, Western Kentucky's not the best team in the world, but it was not nice for Ohio State fans to see Kyle McCord go out there 19 of 23 318 yards three touchdowns and Trevion Henderson looking a little bit more like freshman year Trevion Henderson again 88 yards on 13 attempts two touchdowns in 58 yards after contact it was an impressive showing by the Buckeyes Sonny what were your thoughts I think uh this was a game that Ryan Day was kind of hoping for um they haven't been looking like world beaters the first two weeks. I mean, they've won soundly, but they weren't playing like Ohio State usually does when they play the smaller schools. Um, yesterday, it looked like it could have been the same thing for the first quarter and a half. You know, the game was still close. Then I think they ran off four straight um, touchdowns to kind of spread things out a little bit. Uh, McCord got to got a chance to really build his confidence because obviously we all know they've got a big game coming up next week. And there's been some questions going on about whether that quarterback room is settled or not. I think Ryan Day really does think that this is probably the best case scenario where just beating down and just showing, you know, McCord getting his confidence up, the receivers making all the plays that they they have made. Um, I think this is what they need to moving into that big game next week. I agree. Yeah. Mark, you have any thoughts about this game or the game next week for Ohio State? All sorts of thoughts. Uh, both sides of the ball was the tonic that Ohio State needed. Uh, yeah, they looked sluggish, way below their expectations the first two weeks of the season, although we're looking at 20 and 23, 28-point victories the first two two weeks of the season. Uh, so Ryan Day made a smart move, but what was the obvious move? That he needed to name a starting quarterback to play one game, start to finish, be the guy going into the Notre Dame week, gain that confidence, and I don't know if it was just coincidence 
uh, or if Kyle McCord was just a different player because he didn't have to battle. He didn't have to be, be looking over his shoulder, wondering when he was going to get yanked. He got all the first team reps all week. He's the guy. He knows it. Now it's his offense. And they exploded. They were crazy good in this game. Uh, from an offensive standpoint, uh, you mentioned Travion on Henderson. There's been much debate among Ohio State fans and media considering They've got five talented running backs, like top five to eight recruits at the running back position in their particular classes, and and they all bring something different to the table. And Travion Henderson seems to be kind of the the guy that's the the big uh, open field runner, but because of their offensive line issues, wouldn't necessarily be the guy that should be the first selection to be in the backfield for this offense with their offensive line being an issue. Uh, but he had a nice game in this one. Uh, Chip Tranum had um, the lead role against Michigan last year. He was a guy that only had one carry going into the Michigan game, but it's been a guy that uh, has played both linebacker and running back, and considering his lack of time at running back, is a really good player. Uh, so they got some interesting options at running back. I think they've got the deepest running back room in the country, uh, maybe not the best at the top end, and we know about their receiver. So – Kyle McCord got his start. I think this is more about pass protection and about the offensive line making, uh, preparing themselves for a Notre Dame front seven that's going to be far better than anything they've seen thus far. Uh, and then the other notables on defense, uh, you know, this Western Kentucky crew, they throw the ball as well as anybody in the country for their level of play. And Austin Reed's threw 40 touchdowns last year. So they're used to scoring a, a ton they're the conference favorite to win it again this year, and Ohio State held them to 10 points, and their defense was all over this uh, hilltopper offense. So that's also a good sign going into Notre Dame, considering Ohio State's defense statistically was really good last year, but people that follow it know that they weren't anything close to Ohio State standards when they played the best teams on the schedule. So really good win for the Buckeyes probably meant a lot for their confidence too, going to Notre Dame. You're right. You're right. And a team that maybe had their confidence shot a little bit is their arch rivals up North. Uh, the Michigan Wolverines who face Bowling Green. Uh, this game was 31 to six. And even though the defense played really well, uh, JJ McCarthy, he had some struggles in this game, eight for 13, 143 yards, two touchdowns, but three interceptions. Blake Corum was phenomenal. 12 carries, 101 yards, two touchdowns really carried this team. Uh, they only ran 44 plays in the game. So Michigan, was not uh, running a whole lot uh, in this game. Mark, uh, you get eyes on this game. What do you think of JJ and everything that went on with their offense? Well, that's the first thing that hit me when I started to dive into this game last night was running 44 plays. That's almost humanly impossible, but there were certain circumstances in the game in regards to turnovers and things that happened that they kind of added some nuance to the game that just kind of made it that way. And then they had a comfortable lead in the second half and Harbaugh is not one to run up the score typically. So they just kind of got off the field and they had a ton of three out three and outs, both with the first team offense. And when they switched it out, uh, surprising that JJ McCarthy had one bad game uh, to me because he was so sharp. The first two games, uh, they had issues running the ball. The first two games for them had issues running the ball. Uh, I, I don't consider this a huge concern. If they repeat this against Rutgers, let's say they only beat Rutgers by 10 to 14 points this week, or it's a sloppy offensive showing, or McCarthy has some issues again, then I may start to wonder, but I don't necessarily know that this team was fully focused or firing on all cylinders or really fired up for this game, knowing that they would win. They were a 40 point favorite. Plus, you got to consider. I don't know how much not having Jim Harbaugh on the sideline for the game affects, you know, you game plan, you do everything and you got the communication worked out, but the guy is not on the sideline for these games. And uh, they, they didn't really have to deal with uh, a challenging opponent during that circumstance, but that may have impacted their proficiency to some degree. 
Right. And, and, and then, you know, another thing Michigan fans can look at is almost every single top tier team has had a game like this with some kind of opponent. Now, maybe, you know, Georgia, their opponent was obviously better this week with South Carolina, but um, nobody is impervious to these kind of games at all. Sonny, uh, what were your thoughts on some of the Michigan struggles? Michigan football this year is playing like a team on a salary and not on a per hour basis. They basically just do what they got to do, clock in, you know, play a minimal amount of plays. They're not trying to embarrass anybody. Just they overpower everyone with talent, with their schemes, and then they just, you know, they're done with the game. Um, Similar to what I talked about with the Ohio State game, I actually think this is a good thing for Michigan. Um, Again, they were, they've been on cruise control and yesterday they were on cruise control, but JJ McCarthy having, you know, his worst game of his career. It's not like there's a huge dent, but just to have a little chink in the armor, just to know that, hey, you know what, we're not, we don't have a straight path to the college football playoffs. You know, we need to shore up a a certain few things because, you know, what can pass against a team in the MAC is not going to pass against, you know, the Ohio States, the Penn States that are coming up uh, in the future. So I think this is just another mental challenge game um it, that's it's good for them to happen now as opposed to uh, a little bit later in the season for sure for sure you want that to be happening early in the year against your easier opponents well a team that looked like an easy opponent to somebody else unfortunately big Ten's team uh minnesota fell to north carolina 31 to 13 uh minnesota's defense did make it hard on may uh they got two sacks they got two interceptions they did a pretty good job of stopping the run pff gave them an 82.6 pff run defense grades which if you know anything about pff that's pretty good uh and they also did at one point get 13 unanswered points in that game uh sunny did you have any thoughts watching this game or anything uh yeah i mean i watched a bit of it you know again their defense kind of played two angles in the sense where rushing wise you know i think yeah as you said unc had maybe a little bit over 100 yards you know they shut down the uh running game pretty well but drake may you know despite getting some hands in his faces like he had 400 some odd yards um Minnesota's problem, and it's been a problem for a while, is I I don't know if they figured it out offensively yet. You know, and this is luckily they're in the Big Ten West where a lot of teams have not figured it out. Um, I'm not sure, sure the quarterback that they have right now, they don't have the Ibrahim to kind of bail them out. So, again, it, it's easy to win, or, win games against Nebraska, who, you know, is kind of rebuilding and who's going to make mistakes to keep you in the game. But against a team like North Carolina, who has that firepower, who has that Drake, uh, the quarterback, you know, making all these uh, points and touchdowns, it's it's going to be hard for them to kind of keep up with those tile teams. Yeah, for sure. It's a uh, it's a tough road for them, but I think that um, you know they have a good defense and they'll be able to lean on that in most games. We're going to go ahead and skip up to Rutgers, and I'll let Mark talk on this one. Uh, Rutgers versus Virginia Tech. Rutgers, the Scarlet Knights, thirty five to sixteen. I mean, the Scarlet Knights, they're three and zero. They have a good running game. They have a good defense. Really playing some solid Big Ten football. Uh, Mark, can we expect some more wins here from Rutgers? I know Michigan's coming up, but you know, are they going to have a better season? than we've seen lately from them? No. No. Oh. <laughs> <They're Rutgers. laughs> uh, uh, you'll have to give me a rain check to come back and talk about Minnesota. I got a lot to say about Minnesota, but Rutgers, uh, this is, I think, the third or fourth consecutive year that they've started 3-0. and So they don't play anyone. Uh, this Virginia Tech uh, date would, under other coaches, would certainly be Uh, a different deal, but Virginia Tech's one of the worst teams in the Power Five. Uh, It is, they did take care of business. Don't want to downgrade what they did. You're right. The defense, uh, statistically, was really good last year. Now, when they don't get any help from the offense, then they run into issues, and they're going to have a solid ground game. Um, Their top back, uh, Kyle Manon guy, ran for 165 a couple weeks ago against Temple. He had another 100-plus yard effort in this one. Yeah, they. this is a good win for Rutgers. For them to match up against an ACC team that's on their level currently and to be dominant in that win. So again, I don't want to I don't want to rain on Rutgers parade at all. But when it's the better teams in the Big Ten East, now considering what we saw out of Michigan State and we know what's going on there, Maybe that's now a winnable or more than a winnable game. Maybe Redkers should win that game. 
so maybe there are some more wins out there for Rutgers because of the decline of others. But uh, Greg Schiano, he knows how to coach football, and he instantly elevated this program. They had lost 21 consecutive Big Ten games when he took over, and most of those by 40 or 45 points. So they, they're a capable football team. I think they threw for 45 yards in this game, though. That's <laughs> They, you know... Uh, Sonny ran down the ineptitude of a lot of Big Ten Western Division teams when it comes to throwing the ball, and that's Rutgers. That's who they are and what they've been, and they're going to try to win their way. And they they have a passageway, a pathway to a bowl game, and it's a narrow one, but maybe they've found it. Yeah, I think they uh, they are definitely somebody who can get to a bowl this year. Um, I don't expect them to put up a fight against Michigan, but um, you know, maybe it's maybe a bit of an improvement this year for Rutgers. And really, when you're when you're there, uh, that's what you want to see. Let's go on, hop on over, and Sunny, I'll let you talk about Iowa really fast. Iowa versus Western Michigan. Iowa's offense they stalled in the first half. Uh, it was seven to nothing with Mich- with Western Michigan up in the first quarter. Uh, an interception on the first drive. Uh, Cade Maximera throws that uh, and they scored on four of their final drives to really help Brian Ferentz out a little bit here with his scores that he needs. Sonny, uh, what would you think of this game? It was a typical Iowa game. Like, you know, as you said, they were down 7 nothing, and then they had the, the weather delay for a while, came back, scored a field goal and then they kind of woke up after that. Um, I think there's two stories in this game. You know, one you just kind of brought up with the whole Brian Ferentz. Uh, at the end of the game, they could have milked out the clock. They could, you know, take time off the clock and uh, taking that victory home. But they went for it. You know, they tried to, you know, Big Ten's schedule starts next week. And so Brian's got to get those points somewhere. So getting that 41 points yesterday, I think now puts uh, his trajectory over uh, the 25 per game that he needs to average. Um, the other one is obviously, I don't know if any reports have come out yet, is uh, the injury to their tight end, Luke Lachey. You know, he's a big part of their team. And he went down with that foot injury. He had to be helped off. And that could be a very tough injury for Iowa to kind of, you know, solve. I mean, it's Iowa. I'm sure they've got other four or five star tight ends waiting in the wings. But, you know, Lachey is a big part of their team. So, you know, I'm interested to see what the update is going to be on him. Yeah, for sure. And anytime, you know, even if you have talent behind somebody, you still wrap your offense around somebody like Luke Lachey and try to get everybody involved and have that kind of working out that way. So it is a difficult thing, even if you do have talent behind them, but I see exactly what you're saying there, Sonny, that it is fortunate that they are typically very good at that position with their with their people. So uh, moving on to the next game, because we want to make sure we kind of hit everything here and we stay within our time limits. We're going to head on over to Purdue. Purdue versus Syracuse. The Boilermakers, they can't get it done. Hudson, Hudson card turns it over four times. Seven fumbles in this game by Purdue. Um, just struggles here and there. I think they had a few bright spots, but uh, Mark, what did you see in this one? I didn't see anything in this one. <laughs> I got to tell you, I uh, didn't see one play of this game. I did check out the halftime stats because I was watching other stuff and saw that Hudson Card already had four turnovers at that point. I do think he's a good quarterback. Uh, I do think that he's good for what Ryan Walters eventually wants to do, which is completely different than what Jeff Brom did. And that's build a program that's based on running the football play action, throw it 18 or 20 times a game, not 45 like Jeff Brown did with Aiden O'Connell and others and, and, and play to the defense, but he doesn't have the defense to play to uh, at this point. So uh, it's going to be a rough ride for Purdue. Uh, apparently they, I do give them a lot of credit as a program. They went out and scheduled Virginia tech, Fresno state and Syracuse. And if anybody's keeping score, uh, four or six games against uh, the ACC this past weekend, which I can't recall that ever happening. Two conferences getting together six times in one weekend. Big Ten loses four to two. I don't know that the Duke Northwestern game was necessarily a fair fight, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, it's pretty even there. But uh, yeah, Purdue's got uh, nobody was expecting much out of Purdue, I I think, this year. So he's got a bit of a honeymoon, and this is a year to figure out what he has uh, and try to build a program from here. 
I agree. I agree. I think uh, it'd be a tough season for the Boilermakers, but I think that they can improve and uh, build upon uh, a good amount of things here. Sonny, uh, Maryland, they beat Virginia 42-14, to 14, 42 unanswered points to finish the game. Uh, no offensive TDs in the first quarter. Uh, they did get a kickoff return for a touchdown, but uh, they did have a missed field goal. Uh, this was on Friday night, so Sonny, I'm sure you saw it. What were you thinking in this one? I did. Uh, down 14 nothing kind of surprised me a little bit, but I think Maryland might be the most confident team in the Big Ten right now. You know, it comes down from their coach, uh, Coach Mike Loxley, who said he this is his best assemblement of uh, talent that he's had. Um, their offense is just, you know, they're throwing strikes. They know what they're doing. Um, they took advantage of uh, Virginia's quarterback. Uh, once they got rolling, you know, it would the – Outcome was never really in doubt on Friday. No, it wasn't. Yeah, you're right. Once uh, they really got the rushing game going, too, uh, that was one that I didn't know that they would go as hard into in that game. But four rushing touchdowns, you can't you can't complain about it. So, all right, from this point on, we're going to try and go a little bit rapid fire here. We'll try to do it each game with one person for about a minute, so that way we can hit within our time. The Wisconsin game, Wisconsin struggles in the first half, but they also didn't have Braylon Allen for most of the first half. Seven to seven at the end of the first half, four carries for Braylon Allen. That's it. But he did finish the game with 94 yards, 12 attempts, two touchdowns. I just think in this Wisconsin era right now with Luke Fickle, you are just going to have to ride Braylon Allen as as far as he will take you. Tanner Mordecai, I think he was a great quarterback for SMU. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like he's having the same success at Wisconsin. Maybe he could grow into it. Maybe he could can get there. Uh, but it just doesn't seem like he's making the same plays that he was able to make at SMU. And that defense, it doesn't look like a Luke Fickle defense. Again, maybe times change. Maybe they, they get more into that later on, but it just doesn't look like a defense that you would normally see from Luke Fickle from what he had when he was a DC at Ohio State and when he was the head coach at Cincinnati as well. Uh, another game was Michigan State versus Washington. Uh, I don't think anyone thought this one was going to be close. Sonny, um, 41-7. to Do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, this was just a a buzzsaw of a game. Washington's just, you know, they're, they're themselves are rolling, you know, they're top six, top seven team in the country right now. And Michigan state's just in shambles. You know, they start off the season promising two and oh, and now I'm looking at the rest of their schedule and just all the turmoil that's going on up there. I, I don't even know if they are going to be able to get to a bowl game. So, you know, they got a long road ahead. Yep, yeah, it's a tough season for the Spartans. Hoping that they uh, finish it out and can at least have a few bright spots here and there. Uh, Mark, the game, Indiana versus Louisville. Hey, this was a game that uh, was really fun to watch. I was kind of locked in on it. Liked seeing Taven Jackson play. Do you have any thoughts on it? Well, what's a really good bright sign uh, coming out of this game for Indiana is that if anybody watched them play Ohio State, they basically... Uh, succumb to we're going to lose this game let's just not get blown out and they didn't throw the ball especially with Taven Jackson in the lineup now they alternated quarterbacks with Brendan Sorsby and when he was in the game he was the passer he was the pocket passer and Taven Jackson they didn't throw the ball and so you know we had an Indiana guy on the other day uh, or an Indiana caller asking me <laughs> if they've got any hope for this year and I'm like well they're they they have to have a threat of passing the ball and they got to bring along Taven Jackson and do what he does well, not give him a lot of reads. You know, we are seeing this around college football. Alabama would be the most famous of the situations right now where they've got a quarterback that they designated in Jalen Milrow as the guy, and he can't go through progressions and read a defense, or he's just going to throw the ball to the other team. So you just shut down the passing game and and make it one read or go. One read, it's not there. You take off and run. You're an athlete. And that's what your passing game becomes. Now, uh, it, so good development there in regards to throwing for 300 yards, coming off doing nothing in the passing game the first two games of the season. And uh, they fight back from 21 nothing. Now, Tom Allen makes kind of a head-scratching call at the goal line at down 21-14. They've got a fourth in inches, and they're hiking the ball back. And it, 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 yeah. So anyway, they, they didn't go with the quarterback sneak to try to, to win the game there or tie the game. 
Um, so Tom Allen <laughs> maybe is his own worst enemy here. I know that he said after the game that play calling doesn't matter. You got to execute the play. Then why call plays? Why don't you just call the same play over and over and over and over? And you can fire the offensive coordinator and just perfect one play is what you would do. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, Indiana, it's a, it's a tough loss. It's a gut wrenching loss, but they played a good Louisville team and they played them well and they came back and outscored them in the second half. So depends how you want to look at that. The pessimist is going to say they blew another game. They lost. Uh, the optimist can say they can build from this, especially with a young freshman quarterback. Yeah, I've kind of said all season long, Tom Allen will be a very good DC at a Big Ten program or some other Power Five program someday. But unfortunately, he's just not the the head coach that I think many people think he could be. He's motivational, all those things. But, uh, you know, those comments at the end, you know, you have to just do the play kind of just shows, you know, this guy. He's much more of a DC, probably in that range. All right, two games left. Semi, Northwestern, Duke, 38 14. Any thoughts on this one? This said, uh, Northwestern should be grateful for that Big Ten media contract. Because otherwise, they could be running into the same late 80s, Evanston, winless for 30 games in a row. You know, obviously, they're going to have the financial resources where hopefully that won't happen. But I mean, there's dark days ahead for the guys in Evanston. Yep, we'll, uh, we'll hope that they get some of those issues figured out, but you're right. For now, it's just kind of win the games you can and, and move on from there. Last game, Nebraska at Northern Illinois, 35-11. to 11. Uh, Jeff Sims did not play in this game. He's out with an ankle injury. Uh, some fans are speculating that doesn't really mean that he's out. He just got benched. Uh, Matt Rule did give confidence to Sims in a press conference earlier this week, uh, so it does seem like you know maybe Jeff Sims hasn't lost the job. It's just it's truly the ankle. But I will add this, uh, their quarterback, which I didn't, I, I don't know exactly how to say his last name, but Harburg, I think is how you say it. Um, he is like a tight end playing quarterback. So if you ever want to see somebody the size of, you know, Eric All or Cade Stover out there playing quarterback, go watch Nebraska football when he's starting because uh, that'll be what you want to see. So the Cornhuskers are one or two. Nice to see him get a win. Uh, moving on from there. So, hey, I just want to thank these guys, Sonny and Mark, for coming on uh, so much. Appreciate your time, guys. Uh, go check them out. Mark at the Voice of College Football. Sonny at the Illini cast and what he mentioned earlier. Big Banter Sports, uh, be- please visit our website and f- find our social media as well you won't be you won't be disappointed with what you find there next episode we will be breaking down the wisconsin and purdue game with boiler in texas and rajiv from locked on wisconsin there as well looking forward to that thanks for joining us guys thanks for listening everybody